So we're going to do something a little bit different this week, and this is all intentional. I'm going to not be secretive about any of our intentionality or our plans for this class. Something that we've done the first two weeks is study, well, you guys have been here. We've studied creation. We've studied the fall. We've studied redemption and new creation or restoration. Um, you can interchange some of those roles. And what that is is something that we like to call a very brief overview of the big story in scripture, something that we can call biblical theology. And if, if the idea of biblical theology as defined by T.D. Alexander is the overall theological message of the whole Bible, it helps us see the big picture, appreciate the themes that hold the Bible together, understand how the story develops, see how the promises of the Old Testament sometimes expressed through covenants. We read about that in the essay that we took home. Um, to see how those covenants are fulfilled in Christ as witnessed in the New Testament and appreciate how the Old Testament provides patterns or types that explain later developments in the story. And so that's, that's what a helpful uh, acronym like CFRR, Creation, Fall, Redemption, Restoration, that's, that's just biblical theology in a nutshell. It's a great way for us to understand how did it all begin? How did it go wrong? How did God make a way for us through all these different covenants? And then through, of course, the perfect son, Jesus Christ. And then how one day we are promised this future in the new heavens and the new earth. And like I already said, we took a biblical theology approach to that. What we're going to do this week is we're going to take a systematic theology approach. Before I share that definition, the question might be why? And the answer is that this class, as Aaron shared last time, it's, it's geared to a wide array of people, namely new believers, renewed believers, people who are looking just to dig in and learn some of the foundational truths that we study as Christians, and also people that would just be new to Lakeview. What does Lakeview stand for? What do we believe? What do we teach about the Bible? And what do we believe about discipleship? What are the different avenues and routes that we can take to become disciples, to be disciples, to live out a life of discipleship? And so the first two classes, biblical theology, this class, more of a systematic theology flavor. And some of the upcoming classes, we will take a hermeneutical approach, which is just a big word that's going to discuss how we study the Bible. Our next session, we're going to talk about how we walk out our faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. So a more practical Christian living approach, God willing, in that class. And then we'll end up with something, another big word, ecclesiology. We're going to study the church. We're going to look at the church and where we fit into it. We're trying to give everyone here different flavors of what discipleship looks and tastes like. Because God willing, as we branch out this discipleship university at this church, you guys have a feel for what these categories look like. And as we offer different courses over the years, you can say, okay, I'd be interested in that next round of systematic that they're t teaching and offering. Or I'd be interested in maybe we'll have a biblical theology class that talks about Christ uh, throughout scripture. So whatever we wind up offering, again, we're just looking to help you guys out to understand that. So, all right, systematic approach tonight. Well, systematic theology, according to Gerald Bray, is the attempt to put Christian doctrine in a logical order often starting from one fundamental principle. What does that mean? Well, it's, it's quite easy. Take one fundamental principle, any fundamental principle from the Bible, like sin. And you can get very specific with that. You could say, what about the sin of pride? Okay, I'm going to look at pride, and I'm going to pick up my Bible, and I'm going to find every passage that speaks about pride. And through that systematic study of the fundamental doctrine of pride or the fundamental idea, principle of pride, sin as pride is sin, I'll learn what the Bible has to say about it. And thank God, you don't have to sit down and do that by yourself. <laughs> that's why we have these classes. And when we have these classes, that's why we pull out that big fat systematic theology book because very intelligent men and women 
have done work like that for us over the centuries. We don't have to just think that we need to figure all this out on our own. We, we don't. We have so much help. We have so much help. We're going to utilize that this week. And the question would be, well, Keith, why, why would I have to go that route? Why would I have to do something called systematic theology? Is that really necessary for a Christian to do in today's world? And in order to examine that, I want to read from an interview that the famed political commentator Ben Shapiro had in late 2018 with a man by the name of Bishop Robert Barron. Robert Barron is currently the bishop of the diocese and of Winona, Rochester, which is in Minnesota. He's an acclaimed Catholic author, speaker, and theologian. And in that conversation, in that interview, Shapiro asked him, so let me ask you, what's the Catholic view on who gets into heaven and who doesn't? And Bishop Barron's answer was very telling. He said, the Second Vatican Council says it very clearly. Christ is the privileged route to salvation, that God so loved the world, he gave his only son that we might find eternal life. However, Vatican II clearly teaches that someone outside the explicit Christian faith can be saved. Now, they are saved through the grace of Christ indirectly received. So the grace comes from Christ, but it might be received according to your conscience. So if you're following your conscience sincerely, or in your case, talking to Ben Shapiro, a Jew, in your case, you're following the commandments of the law sincerely, yeah, you can be saved. And very similarly, I once had a conversation with a friend while we were vacationing in Italy. Uh, I was a brand new Christian, and I had had this experience in church where I, I met the Lord. I met Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. I was saved, and I'm navigating how to talk with people about that. And I'm standing in the town of Siena in Tuscany outside of the Duomo, which is this massive cathedral that makes the St. Louis Cathedral look paltry and weak and cheap in comparison. And as I'm speaking with my friend, I tell him, you know, I, I was in church a few months ago and I, I was sitting there through the sermon and I realized as he was preaching, as, as each verse was being shared, that I was guilty of my sin and that I needed to be forgiven. And I, and I suddenly simultaneously understood that Jesus had forgiven me. Not only had he forgiven me, but he loved me. And, and I didn't know how to describe it to him. I was trying to explain to him how the Holy Spirit came into my life and just radically changed everything. And my friend, whom I love and respect, looked at me with a nod and a little bit like of a half smile. And he said, you know, Keith, I believe that when we die, you know, if, if we've lived a good life and we've worked hard and we've done the right things with what we have in front of us, that God's going to take care of us and that everything's going to be okay. And that we would get into heaven by that criteria. And the interesting and beautiful thing about the Bible is that it doesn't allow us to operate in that type of middle ground. It doesn't give us the freedom to say, okay, I had this experience at church where I now claim Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I've been radically changed by the power of the Spirit. And also at the same time, if I as a man live a decent, good life according to whatever I deem to be decent and good, that I would then enter into some undefined paradise. And that can be true, and this can be true, and that's all okay. Thank God the Bible doesn't give us that freedom. The Bible doesn't operate in a modern subjective middle ground where one person has the truth and the other one has a different truth, and that's both okay. No. The Bible says, Jesus says, that we must be born again. Um, and born again is not just a term, by the way, reserved for like the guys you see at the end of Bourbon Street with the sign that says, repent and believe for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You can't walk down Bourbon Street. 
and, and I'm not knocking those guys. I've been there before, actually, with some wonderful people. And that, if you ever want an, exp an interesting evening, go stand on Bourbon Street with a sign that has any type of scripture on it, and you will have an interesting night, <laughs> to say the least. You may get flipped off. You may get cursed out a little bit. You may get weird questions about the most random things, but it will be interesting. And, and one of the things that you will experience at a time like that is you will find people, not just there, but all over, who'll say, Keith, I'm a Christian, but I don't know if I'm one of those types of Christians. I don't know if I'm one of those born-again types. And like I've already said, we don't get that middle ground to play with the roles and the titles. Jesus said, you must be born again. So with that, let's go into John 3 as we begin to examine what it means to be born again. I believe I have a slide that talks about born again equaling a, a theological term that I'm going to introduce you to now called regeneration. If you've never heard the word regeneration, it just means born again. And I may use these interchangeably, so I wanted you to know what I'm talking about. Born again equals regeneration. Wayne Grudem in his systematic theology defines regeneration as a secret act of God in which he imparts new spiritual life to us. A secret act of God in which he imparts new spiritual life to us. And he, we get this directly from our Lord and Savior. In John chapter 3, read with me verse 1 through 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And let's look at some background on Nicodemus and this interaction with Jesus. Who is this man, Nicodemus, that Jesus is speaking to? Well, one, he's a Pharisee, which means that he is an expert in the law of Moses. Not just an expert in the law, but an expert in how to observe the law of Moses. This title, Pharisee, means separate. The Pharisees actually kept to themselves on account of their viewing the vast majority of Israel to be unclean, and sinful according to the Jewish law. These men were high above that. You might call them the original Instagram influencers without Instagram being around. These were the people who more than anyone else would have set the standard of life, Jewish life. They would have set the standard of what it means to worship God, of what it means to practice that faith. If you wanted to know what to do, what to think, what to look like, how to act, you looked at a man like Nicodemus. Secondly, Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin, a ruling body of 70 members, and this was the highest ruling religious authority over the Jews. This authority often extended, even though they were ruled by the Roman Empire, this authority often extended to criminal authority as well. And it could only be overridden by the Roman authorities. The Sanhedrin eventually was also the group that would put Jesus himself on trial. Now, Jewish tradition also places Nicodemus as one of the three richest men in all Jerusalem. One of the three richest men. He was the best of the best at that time, in that culture. Unmatched in intellect, unmatched in his knowledge of the law and his righteous living, he was the cream of the crop, the most religious, the most studied, the most holy, separate, set apart. And so why then does this man come to Jesus at night? You would think a man like this would be able to walk in any room in Jerusalem at any time, however he wanted. No one would ask any questions. He'd be the guy that would just give them a look and they'd get scared and whatever. So why does he come to Jesus at night? The Bible doesn't really tell us <laughs> exactly, but as a ruler of the Jews, one of his status, it, it, it definitely brings about suspicion. 
as if he were avoiding being seen, meeting, and conversing with Jesus Christ. He says, Rabbi, we know you have come from God. Unlike many other of his contemporaries, Nicodemus is willing to come with respect, with recognition of who Jesus is, and praise for who Jesus is. And how does Jesus respond to this? Well, he definitely doesn't say, ah, Nicodemus, thank you. Thank you very much. I totally appreciate these accolades coming from a guy as cool and intelligent as you. He doesn't say that at all. He doesn't say, thank you so much for the compliment. I, I really needed a boost in my spirit today. He wasn't flattered. He moved past the compliment, past the surface conversation, and he cut right to the heart of the matter in verse 3 when he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is telling Jesus he must be from God because of the things that he's done. And Jesus corrects him. You think you can identify the things of God, Nicodemus? I tell you this, unless you were born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. This is a necessary condition. And if it were a necessary condition for a man of such high rank and standing as Nicodemus, well, it would be safe to say that it is a necessary condition for us as well, for every one of us, that in order to see the kingdom of God, we must be born again. So why would we need this, though? If it is a necessary condition, why is it a necessary condition? And if we take what the world places upon us, the labels that the world gives us, we often hear phrases like, oh, he's just broken. She's just been hurt enough times. That's why she does this thing that we don't like. That's why he constantly breaks the rules. They're just, you know, they've just been abused or they've just been hurt. But the Bible teaches that those aren't symptoms of the problem. That the, the problem itself. The problem itself. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's look at Genesis chapter 2 again. Verses 15 through 17. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Remember at this time, Adam is sinless. Harmony. Harmonious relationship with God given work to do in the perfect garden of Eden. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but here's the rule. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And as we've already discussed, we all know they ate the fruit. They broke that law. They broke that command. They ate the fruit and the consequences were serious. Immediately, relational separation from God. Immediately, legal guilt. Their standing went from just fine to guilty before God. But the one we're going to focus on tonight is they also immediately became spiritually dead. Their desires, their beliefs, their actions, which then translates to us because we inherit that sinful nature. We too then have desires, beliefs, actions that are spiritually dead. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out what? the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. When Paul writes these verses, he includes everyone, the rest of mankind, everyone in Adam from the moment that Adam transgressed the law that God gave him in the garden. Everyone that belongs under that umbrella term, mankind, inherits that. 
that spiritual deadness in our trespasses and sins. This, the deadness that separates us from God and affects, like I've already said, our desires, our thoughts, our actions. Have you ever stopped? If you've been a Christian for long enough, I think any of us in here could say, you know, that thing that I love to do, that is actually a good thing. Maybe it's serving on the worship team at church. Um, maybe it's leading a Bible study at your home. Maybe it's giving money to your charity of choice. Have you ever reached the point in your Christian walk where you actually realize, you know, I'm getting some good stuff from this interaction right here. When I go do this really great thing, I go do this amazing thing that the rest of the world would say, boy, Keith, he's a great guy. You know, he sings at church all the time. Like that's cream of the crop Christian right there. And at the end of the day, how many times, if I'm, if I'm just going into that and being open, do I admit, man, I actually enjoy this a lot. <laughs> I don't just do this because it's this good thing and I'm such a good person. I love doing this. And if someone were to take it from me, I would, I would be a little upset, more than a little upset. I might even be angry, hurt, disappointed. I might even pull out that inner lawyer and say, well, this isn't right. I'm good at that. I'm better than that other guy over there. Why would they give them the chance to do this when I could get up and yada, yada, yada. And then standing with myself before God one day and realizing over and over again, maybe my desires are a little off. Maybe my thoughts and actions are a little off. Just like the rest of mankind. <laughs> As a result of being dead in trespasses and sins, we became children of God's wrath. And it's important to remember here a distinction that we've spoken on recently. Keith preached on this a little bit a couple weeks ago. There is a difference between being a child of God and being made in the image and likeness of God. Not everyone, we can all claim that we are made in the image of God, that we bear that image, image bearers. It's clear in scripture, it's clear in Genesis 1. The Bible's also clear in later passages, namely John 1, that we are not all children of God. That to those who believed and received him, they were given the right to become children of God. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. But the rest of mankind can be defined here as children of God's wrath. Next in our spiritual deadness, we have to acknowledge the fact that our natural heart is wicked. Aside from what every Disney movie that my kids love to watch and we sing along with ourselves, just the constant reminder. If you've got young kids in the house, it's like a constant reminder. Like, hey, look, we're not going to follow our heart. And the reason why is because Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? What a freedom there is in that for us as Christians to truthfully acknowledge that, hey, when I submit my life to the guidance system that is within my fallen heart, I actually find a lot of trouble. I find a lot of discontent. When I look inside and I dig deep down inside, like the world tells me to, and I, and I try to find a truth there, and then I, I bring it out from my own heart and I put it upon the pedestal of my life, I often find that it has nothing to do with what's actually good for me. And I want to do a ton of things that are actually bad for me, even if they look like good things. Praise be to God. I have a Bible again that doesn't say, okay, Keith, well, you can have that truth over here because you like to do it and you can have this other truth. No. I, I can't. We've got to submit ourselves to scripture here and say that our hearts are deceitful and that we should not seek to fully understand or trust it. Our hearts are in desperate need of healing. Next, Romans 3 teaches us 
again, the rest of mankind, tying into that same idea, reinforcing with these texts that no one is good, not even one. We've all turned aside. Romans 3, 10 through 12 says, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. When Jesus says you must be born again, these truths are just deeply embedded in that statement. Why must you be born again? Well, because you're one of the children of wrath that doesn't seek for God in your own natural, unregenerate state. No one does good. We've all turned aside, become worthless. Not even one. Compared to Christ himself, the perfect fulfillment of the law, the perfect law follower himself in the flesh. Not even one person can say, yeah, I did it. I did it as good as he did it. I followed all the rules. I followed all the laws. In fact, the Bible says that it's not even possible for us to do good or please God in and of our own strength. Romans 8, 7 through 8 says, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Not only does it not submit to God's law, indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Those who are in the flesh, that's another way of saying those who are not born again. It's clear in scripture. In our natural fleshly state, we can neither submit to God's law, nor can we please him. Why? Because we can't even understand the things of God apart from God himself. 1 Corinthians 2 teaches us that the natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God for they are folly to him, foolishness to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Do you remember before following Christ, walking into a church building and there were people still the weirdest thing. If you think about this culturally guys, where else can you go to walk into a room full of people and there will be a grown man, six foot three, 275 pounds, and he'll have his hands in the air on a Sunday morning, possibly a tear running down his cheek, singing, praise God from whom all blessings flow. This big burly man actually trying to create a melody, intoned melody with worship, with prayer. And as a guy, as a girl, as a lady that maybe wasn't saved in the past, you walk into that setting. Do you remember how weird it was the first time you did that? What are these people doing? This is just creepy. This guy's singing as loud as he can, 10 feet away from me. He's getting all emotional. He's moving. I don't even know this guy. And he's going to be that vulnerable and weird in front of all these people. Yeah. Yes. Amen. Oh, thank God. But to that guy that goes in the first time, he has no concept. That's just weird. <laughs> it's just strange and peculiar. Because the heart that is not born again cannot even accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness. Wait up. You mean to tell me that you give like 10% of your money to this church with the nice building. And what does the pastor drive? Let me ask you that. What does he drive, right? That's just crazy to the world. That's just weird. You showed up on a Tuesday night to sit there and listen to some guy talk for 30 minutes about the Bible. That's lame. <laughs> So how does it happen? How are we born again? Well, new birth comes by the spirit of God. If we continue in John chapter three, we read the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. The new birth starts and ends with the spirit of God with the spirit of God. 
just like we don't know where the wind comes from, where it's going, the Spirit of God comes into people's lives and says, you are mine. You will never be the same. Oh, you didn't know this was going to happen this Sunday morning. You didn't know this was going to happen after your mom passed away and you started asking the big questions about life again. You didn't know and you didn't. I didn't. It just happened. Like the wind, we don't know when it's coming, but we always see its effect. A question, who here that's been born again can, can raise their hand and say, yes, I was responsible. I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Who here was responsible for their first birth? I'm jumping ahead of myself. Your first birth, when you came out of your mother's womb, do you remember the decision you made? Like, you know what? Today's the day, Jack. I'm coming out. You definitely weren't there when you were conceived making any kind of decision to be a part of that because that's just weird to think about. We can still say that out in public. None of us made the decision. None of us had any consciousness, any type of being to where we could say, you know what? My parents are going to engage in sexual activity. I'm going to be conceived. And then nine to 10 months from now, I'm going to be born. Why do you think Jesus uses the language that he does then to say, you have to be born again? You didn't make that choice the first time you were born. Why would you think that you made the choice the second time you were born? Of course, maybe some of you actually have reasons why you think that. And we can talk about that later, God willing. But here's one reason that I'd like to talk about. It's by God's rich mercy. Again, in Ephesians 2, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Grace, the free gift of salvation, even when you were dead. I'm sure many of you have heard of this illustration, but how do dead men respond when you wave at them? And you say, hello. How do dead women respond when you go, hey, looking good today, sister? How do dead men respond if they're sunk at the bottom of the sea and their body's decomposing and rotten and you throw them a lifeline and say, I'm here to pull you up. Just grab the rope. Just grab the rope. They respond by being dead. <laughs> They don't do anything. Dead people can't do anything. While we were dead sinners, Christ took our lifeless body, much like he did with Adam's physical body, created out of the dust of the earth, which he created out of nothing. He took our spiritually dead lives existence and he breathed real life true life into it and we were born again you may hear well i'll just pass that up for right now god takes our lifeless body he sets his love upon us and he says live live how so well by being born of god i referenced this earlier but in john chapter 1 verse 13 we read who were born New believers who received and believed, who were born not of blood. They were born not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Have you ever stopped to look at those phrases and just examine them very briefly? Who were born not of blood? Well, that's quite obvious. They weren't just born into God's family because their mother was so-and-so or their father was so-and-so. No, they, they were not born of blood. They weren't born of the will of the flesh. They didn't in and of themselves say, you know what? I'm going to be born again, regenerate today. I'm going to get to know God because I want to. John 1 says no. Nor of the will of man, nor can anybody else, no matter how much they want to. Your mom, your dad, your aunt, your uncle, no matter how much they love you, they cannot 
coerce God into saving you. They cannot, of their own will, force you to be saved, no matter how hard they try. It's of God. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. Our salvation doesn't originate in our will, but in God's. Our first birth placed us into Adam, separate from God, dead in our sins and trespasses. And we had to be born again of God. This is caused by God. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the, de from the dead. Again, we see God's great mercy as the catalyst behind the new birth. God, the great and merciful God, has caused us to be born again. And this was promised in the Old Testament as well. Ezekiel 36, we read, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart. And a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. And give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes. And be careful to obey my rules. This isn't just a New Testament occurrence. This was prophesied in the Old Testament. And was likely what Jesus was calling to the mind of Nicodemus that night. That God alone can take a man and a woman's stony heart and make it a heart of flesh. And breathe new life into it. So what happens as a result of this new birth? Well, it's not a fixing up of our old nature. That old sinful nature. It's not just putting a little, a little spit shine on it. Putting some rouge and some lipstick and saying, there you go. You look great now. It's a brand new nature. We didn't need a polish. We needed to be made new. We needed to be made new. And for those that know Christ, you are new. 2 Corinthians 5 states, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. As born-again believers, our identity goes from being in Adam to now being in Christ. Now and forever, having security in Christ. Our hope is so sure that Paul says, for the believer who has been given the new birth, Paul uses the past tense. Remember, we already said this from Ephesians 2. When Paul's talking about believers, he's using the past tense. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we in the past were dead in our trespasses. He's now made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with him. And so when we are asked the question or when we ask ourselves the question, how do you know that you're going to heaven? How do you know that you're good with God? We don't give the answer that Bishop Robert Barron gave earlier and said, well, um, I, I didn't really follow Christ, but I followed my conscience and I did it with a genuine heart. And so I'm going to earn whatever that salvation looks like. We don't answer that question in that manner. How do I know that I'm going to heaven? Well, I know that I'm good with God because he calls me his own, because he called me out of darkness. He didn't just clean me up. He didn't just put a polish on me. He made me his son. He gave me a new heart. By the power of his spirit now, I embrace and accept his son Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And because of what Christ did, resurrected from the dead, because the grave could not hold him, because he had not earned death, the wages of sin is death. Jesus the fulfiller of the promises overcame death and the grave. We have full assurance because he was resurrected from the dead. And as our elder brother, we can expect not to receive in Adam, 
the just punishment for our sins, but in Christ, freedom from sin, freedom from condemnation, and perfect fellowship with God. This hope can never be taken away. I'll end with this. 1 Peter 1, 23 through 25. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you don't just leave us with the wishy-washy ideas that the world loves to bring forward to say that we can have one set of truth and someone else can have another set of truth and that our eternal destiny is tied in with this weird, undefinable, ambiguous idea, but that when you came face to face with Nicodemus, one of the most influential men of his time. You said, even you need to be born again. Establishing for us, God, that we all, in order to see you, would need to be born again, regenerated, given new hearts, God, that we can rest in that truth, knowing that we didn't earn our salvation by following certain rules that we just make up but that because of the great love with which you've loved us, you called us out of that. You pulled us from death to life. You washed us clean. And you made us your son or your daughter. And in that work, we can fully rest and we can fully celebrate that one day we will see you face to face. And when we hear the phrase, well done, my good and faithful servant. It will be because we are clothed in the righteous robes of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, haste the day when we see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, before we take a quick break, quick plug, baptism class, 9 a.m. this Sunday. Also, the next session, we will cover walking in this new birth in life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's take a five minute break, use the restroom, get something to drink, and then we'll have table discussion. Thank you guys.